Uh, so my name is Duncan Gallant. I'm the research and evaluation quarter for JEDI. I think I got to talk enough already. So I'd like to pass the floor over to, to Connor and then we'll keep going. Uh, hi, I'm JEDI summer student and I'm helping out Duncan today. And I'm excited for our discussion. So. Great, and, and Krista Thompson, you're first on my screen, so you get to go next. Hi, I'm Krista Thompson. I'm the director of the Atlantic Aboriginal Economic Development Integrated Research Program at the Atlantic Policy Congress. Okay. And I'm I'm just interested in in what you have uh, for tools to overcome obstacles. I'm I'm very excited to hear. All right, great. Um, and Faith Matcha, you're next on my list. I don't know if it's alphabetical or not, but you're next. Hi, uh, I'm Faith Batch. I'm with uh, Farm Credit Canada. I'm a VP of Operations, and um, I'm here to understand and learn what the obstacles are. Awesome. Great. Uh, Krista Chase, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Good. Um, I'm Krista Chase. I'm a commercial account manager with RBC, and I would just like to understand how I could be a better ally and where to um, try to help bring impact. Great, thank you, Krista. Uh, Deborah Donovan. Nice to Hi, uh, Deborah Donovan. I'm an Indigenous consultant and has worked many years in mainstream business, but I've been focusing my, I guess, my services with, to the First Nation communities. Uh, in Ontario and Nova Scotia, New Brunswick for the past uh, several years as well. And I do see obstacles while dealing with my First Nation communities, but on the same token, um, I, I'm sure there are obstacles that I'm not aware of but that I don't always see. And I would like <clears throat> to learn more and hopefully get better at helping them overcome their obstacles. <laughs> Great. Now, a noble purpose. Uh, Sh Sherry Coates, you're next. Hi, I'm Sherry Coates. I'm with Work Again B in New Brunswick, uh, Department of Post-Secondary Education, Training and Labor, and I'm the director here in the Fraser Regional Office. So for myself, I just want to be part of the discussion and help to understand what some of those obstacles are and hopefully help to remove some of those obstacles. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, David Brennan. Hi, I'm Dave Brennan. I'm with Farm Credit Canada as well, a colleague of FACE. Um, I work with Farm Credit's uh, agribusiness and agri-food sector, so food processing, um, value-added industry for agriculture. So here to learn what the challenges are and try to understand, um, you know, what we can do to play a role. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Carrie Dunning. Hi, Carrie. I might be on mute. There you go. Um, okay, so my name is Carrie Dennett, and um, I'm the program support officer for um, training skills and development with Working NB. Um, and I'm just looking to learn more about some of the challenges and um, see where I might be able to fit in to be able to help. Great. Uh, Katie McDonald next. Hi there, um, I'm Katie McDonald and I'm a program coordinator for um, Skilled Trade Exploration Program. Um, we're an organization here in New Brunswick helping underrepresented groups um, get into skilled trades. So here to understand um, better what the obstacles are and how, how it can help with those challenges. Great, thank you Katie. And uh, Brian Hart. Today, I'm Brian Harn. I am a business development officer for Ulnawig Development Group. We uh, we provide financing to Indigenous entrepreneurs across Atlantic Canada, and uh, I think similar to to most people here, just uh, interested in hearing about the outcomes and, and anything uh, we can contribute or uh, or take away in order to improve uh, and overcome barriers. Great, thank you, Brian and uh, Natasha Gogan. I think I say your last name. Natasha, you may be on mute. Yes, sorry, I was. <laughs> uh, Natasha Gauguin, yeah. Uh, so I am an account officer with ACOA and uh, just here to listen in and hopefully get some tips and tricks. All right. Thank you very much. And I don't think I missed it. So I can definitely conclude it's not alphabetical based on the list we were going through. Uh, but did I miss anybody? Is anybody on the line that it's not on my screen here? Um, Maybe Jeff Provost, for example. Hey, Jeff, would you like to do a brief introduction of yourself if you're on the line? I 
Yes, yeah, sorry, I just yeah. joined the room. No um, yeah, my name is Jeff Provo. I'm, I'm calling in from Treaty 1 Territory and Homeland and Métis Nation here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Excellent. And I'm uh, representing uh, Burke Construction. And uh, we're looking to do, um, you know, obviously uh, partnerships with Indigenous groups and organizations uh, coast to coast, to the coast in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so really I'm here to, uh, you know, use my ears more than my mouth and, and kind of just, you know, absorb as much as I can and listen and learn, if that makes sense. All right. No, that's valid. Well, thank you all for, uh, for your introductions. So um, the plan for this session is I'll uh, go through um, the section relating to the obstacles uh, as per um, to the discussions in 2019. And uh, hopefully, um, um, so as, uh, as I moderate things, uh, feel free to, um, uh, Connor's going to keep an eye on the chat if people are raising their hands. But really, I think we're a small enough group, you can just kind of pipe in. So uh, interruptions at this point are just seen as positive engagement. They're not a, they're not, not a nuisance. So uh, positive interruptions are encouraged. Um, but like I said, I'll kind of go through things. I got to minimize you guys on my screen a bit so I can see my, my PowerPoint. Um, and uh, yeah, at any time, uh, Connor, just feel free to jump in or uh, somebody else, but I'll, I'll go through this session. Um, so um, the general key of this one, I think as I was alluding to, so we're gonna report back to stakeholders, uh, which includes all of you, as well as those that are not in attendance. So we'll kind of talk about how we engage people that have, are not able to attend um, these sessions. Um, and we're talking about key challenges as per the SHRC report. Um, we're gonna further define and clarify the challenges that are there. We're gonna make additions and modifications if, if we see a uh, fit. Uh, and um, we'll produce uh, ideally a, a refined and updated list of key challenges for developing an action plan for our next session on Thursday. So they're definitely related. So come back for more, basically. Um, so I think, as I said before, um, JEDI staff uh, conducted a, a survey so that we, we, we formally came up with a number of questions to kind of get, get um, uh, encouraged, we'll say, varying opinions on how to approach economic development. The SWOT analysis was there. Um, I think, as I mentioned, SWOT is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, so strengths and uh, weaknesses, oh, sorry, cat alert. <laughs> and uh, are the internal uh, focuses and uh, opportunities and threats are the external. Um, and, um, and throughout the event, we had a lot of group discussions. So that, that's all related. Um, and so uh, the, it was noted by Tyler Foley, the, um, Tyler Foley, the author of the, the report that uh, the previous research around economic development kind of fit um, the responses we got as well. So, it's, so it didn't, um, there didn't seem to be any major outliers in terms of the challenges that were coming forward. Uh, so the first, this is, we'll look at the survey responses. So I think this should be relatively visible for you guys. So this was a part of the survey that went out to the 130 participants. So what are the top three challenges for your community um, and that they face in terms of economic development? So financing came up there uh, with, with, with 24, so it's the lead. And then social issues and human resources and finding qualified staff. Um, so you can um, so those are the top three, and that was the list that I included with the major uh, major update we did previously. Um, but as well, the, the lack of land came; it wasn't too too far behind human resources, federal and provincial policies and regulations. Uh, again, it was was is right on top of uh, we're lined up with lack of land, developing business plans and proposals. Uh, again, eleven responses said that was a major challenge. Um, infrastructure. Governance structure. So we've got governance structure and um, and uh, we'll say uh, the federal provincial policies and regulations above. So I think uh, at least one of the uh, explanations of this que uh, question for what governance structure was is is, a, is either community based or, or organizational based. So it's uh, it's interesting that came up. Um, I think it comes up in the SWOT analysis as well, um, but it's just kind of a, kind of a note. Uh, and then information, statistics, labor market information, economic forecasting, uh, five participants said that was a major a challenge and then uh, two other. Um, so um, for, for, for me, uh, financing is always, is always interesting because it can mean different things to different groups. Um, I'll, I think I'll go through the next question to kind of give you a sense. I think it's asked a little bit differently. So what are the top three challenges that entrepreneurs in your community face? Um, and so this is access to financing. Uh, it was 30 respondents uh, uh, mentioned that. A business plan or an entrepreneurship training. Social issues again comes up. So I think social issues is, if we look, um, is, is number two here for the community. And it comes up as a number three for entrepreneurs as well. 
Um, and then financial and digital literacy uh, is, is a note. Uh, marketing capacity, uh, mentorship and mentorship access, uh, legal information, uh, accounting skills, uh, physical space to work. Um, and so in 2019, I think that probably has a different context now, but it's uh, it's still probably valid. We hear we hear from different people um, as, as well still COVID-19. Um, so we'll go through the strength and I can go back and forth as we need. So if, if to help the discussion, if it makes sense to go back to a previous question, we can do that. But I'll look at the SWOT analysis. So any, uh, so the weaknesses, which would be internal, and then threats, which are external. So the weaknesses, challenges. So that, well, it's, that's the weakness is not a very nice word, but basic challenge. Um, so social issues was identified during this exercise as, as an internal challenge. Uh, leadership, governance, administration. So it's, this is interesting because it came up on, on the internal challenge side. But uh, the other session on opportunities Leadership governance administration uh, comes up as there as well, so it means it's it's it's, it's likely a, a you know it's a local issue. It's 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 really, it just depends on on I guess the relationship with with leadership governance administration with different communities. But it came up in both categories, so I just I don't want to I don't want to peg that as 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 uh, as a as the as a, as a major challenge because it's it's coming up in a different context and in a different question. Um, so location. Uh, three people, uh, or three, sorry, three participants identified that as a, as a challenge. Uh, relationship with municipality, culture and language loss uh, as well came up as well. So these are internal threats uh, being the external. So political instability and change. So it was noted by def, uh, several uh, participants of um, basically establishing relationships with, uh, with political officials or, or government officials and either turnover or, or uh, let's say election cycles being an issue of, of Having to recreate those relationships over again, or, or having to having to re um, re educate um, uh, uh, representatives on, on certain issues. Um, community wellness uh, came up uh, again. So you see, we have community wellness. We've got social issues here on on kind of both ends of this. And we know when we asked the the communities and the entrepreneur, uh, what was what was the challenge for communities and entrepreneurs? Uh, so uh, we saw social issues there as well. So it's it's a pretty prevalent. Um, challenge that comes up for the community level, uh, for the entrepreneurship level, and, and then when we do a, a kind of a different approach of asking the questions, um, it, uh, a community, you know, community wellness comes up as an external threat or, or a you know, threat to the community wellness. Uh, and then climate change and flooding was also noted, and, and resistance to change. So these are all uh, things that would be interesting for up, up for interpretation. So. Um, the three, the, so out, out of mostly the survey, because we had some qualitative uh, and quantitative uh, responses to that, where we can kind of rank them, uh, the financing and social, uh, social issues and resources. Uh, those were the kind of the major obstacles that came out of, uh, we'll say they're, they're the, uh, the, the most, plur uh, the, 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 I have the most of all, the, the, they got the plurality of, of people saying that those are the biggest issues. Um, there was a note throughout the, uh, the, the, the gathering that uh, there's a need for meaningful and respectful relations with government and the private sector. So if you had to add a fourth or add, add each of these into a context, um, there were, uh, we heard it uh, a lot that participants were looking for uh, that they, there needed to be improvement with relationships with government and the private sector. Uh, and so that, that could impact financing social issues and human resources, but um, it also could be a fourth. Uh, that it's its own thing of uh, there was a, a note for needed improvement, which was uh, which is interesting. And so additional things that came out just so these are of note, but uh, it was harder to create a, a ranking for them. Uh, so governance, administration, leadership, shifting government policies, community wellness and location. Um, and so um, this is basically what what came out of it. I, I'm I'm open to uh, uh, people's interpretation and. Uh, and different aspects of, of the financing concern. So um, does, um, I know we've got all the way here. We've, uh, I think we've got um, uh, a couple of indigenous organizations. So um, does anybody have an, an example or, or can we kind of make more, uh, more clarity to why financing is the number one obstacle uh, from, from the community point of view? I might be able to put my nickels worth in that one. Sure. Um, Governance, if you look at it as a as an overall process within any organization, whether it's an indigenous community or mainstream business, 
It's basically how you conduct business and how you manage and control the funds and the results and the accountability for the funds. Um, <clears throat> and lack of governance within all units of a community um, will prevent, I guess, approval of loans and grants and programs because neither private industry or banking institutions or government agencies want to, um, I'll say, uh, I'll use the hard words, part with cash mm. if they have a strong sense that it won't be managed properly and it won't accomplish the intended goal. Okay. So that's why uh, a lot of the topics I saw in, in the surveys would be resolved through a, a good uh, structure, governance structure within the community, for example, or the business, uh, whichever the example might be. Because if your governance is, is, if you've got good governance, it means you're managing your risk, you're managing your, you're planning your work uh, and you're delivering it as per plan because it would be that plan that would get financed ultimately. And it, the results of the plan are what are gonna benefit, are the beneficiaries, which is basically the community right mm -hmm. so <clears throat> governance uh i could put a lot of different terms under that one topic but if you have governance financing comes okay um i i wonder if um so in, in terms of governance is there a couple um we'll say uh the salient issues that come out of that in terms of is it is it is it is it, a, is, it a, is it accounting is it um uh, is it, uh, and we'll say, you know, succession planning, or is there certain aspects that would be kind of? It's the uh, integration of all the above, Duncan. That's what yeah. it meant by governance. It's not just one siloed function within a, a unit, a business unit. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Because, for example, procurement ties into your finance, uh, levels of authority, uh, and that ties back into your organization structure and your roles and responsibility. Who has the authority for this? Who has the uh, ability to do, to do what at what stage, et cetera. Um, so it, it's not just, you can't just sort of fix one piece. It's really how all the pieces work together. That's what's the sum of which is in, is governance. Now, in order to fix it, if you want to use that term, yes, we're going to take that elephant in one bite at a time and depending on the circumstance. So you can't cookie cutter the solution. You have to go in and assess I guess the state of the organization, uh, organizational assessment, and then you contrast that with what the uh, stated or intended hopes or dreams are, and then you try and you try to assess objectively in that process the current state of affairs. We'll say whether mm -hmm. it's the people, the resources, the fight, whatever, and when you put it all together, that should quite often will create a list of recommendations or a path and quite often the priority in which you have to address these issues so that at the end of the day, your unit, whether it's a band office or a business, is properly governed. Okay, no, that's, that's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, the, um, and so you, you, had, you had mentioned the start of that would be um, uh, ba basically a, 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 a localized review. Right, uh, it could go yeah, in, uh, in a general that. assessment. Yeah, general. I call it organizational assessment. That's what I label it when I do that work. But, uh, and that's usually like, for example, I had one community in um, Northern Ontario. Um, they had, you know, they were, and I also, I, I, I kind of classify different communities as a level one, two, or three maturity level. For example, level one might be a small community with no real structure at all. Uh, a level three might be the most organized community and there's no real problems because they've got all this governance stuff un, you know, under control. So quite often I'll get a, a level two organization say, fine, we've had these problems, we've overcome this, but it's still not working. And this is what we're trying to do. So then I thought, okay, fine. I'll go ahead and do a, 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 an organizational assessment. Just basically interview everybody. I'll ask a lot of questions, everything else like that around all functions. And then as a business person, the gaps to me become pretty evident, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you've identified the gaps, then you probably have identified the root cause for some of the problems. So then, then it's a matter of recommending what the fix should be. Okay. Then the next piece goes to that leadership because 
you can provide the leadership with the ammunition they need to solve the problems, but depending on their political process, that plan will just sit on the shelf because nobody wants to approve it. Nobody, because it typically requires a BCR in order to ensure that the plan outlives the current leadership. Because if you've got a community that has elections every two years, for example, versus a community that has an election every four years, uh, no, and I just yeah. uh, you mentioned BCR, so uh, so yeah. myself included, uh, and others on the call. So uh, what's the BCR? Uh, Band Council resolution. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Sorry for interrupting. No um, problem. The um, okay. No, is it? It's all. Uh, it's all valid. Um, I I wonder. So so Deborah, thank you for your, your thoughts. We can certainly come back. Um, so I'm just um, looking on my uh, my screen here. Um, Faith or Krista, do you guys have any any comments about whether it's um, so, uh, I guess the impact or, or even if we can clarify a bit, you know, financing or social issues or human resources. Go, go ahead, Krista, because you've got some interesting comments in the chat. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I guess what I see as a financier might be different than the community's perspective from what I see um, those in governance management positions are having to trade off good business decisions with what's going to satisfy community members. So they're trying to make um, long-term kind of strategic plans and business decisions, uh, which the bank wants to also uh, support them in doing. But a lot of times the community members, it, it might be a challenge to get them to understand the long-term strategic vision and buy into those decisions. And they're having to kind of, you know, depending on where the community is and its attitude towards housing and, and what band membership means to them, um, it might be a challenge in getting them on board with, for example, individuals going out and getting uh, what we used to call Section 10 housing financing, so basically their own loan for their own house as opposed to um, getting on the waiting list for ban provided housing. Um, it's, it's kind of an attitude shift. I know to the banks right now are all changing in how they look at financing indigenous, indigenous communities. I think a lot of banks are moving to look at it more as public sector type financing, how you would finance a municipality. Whereas in the past, I think a lot of financial institutions looked at it in terms of how we would finance any other business, any type of business. It used to be a large reliance on ministerial guarantees. Some institutions have left those completely behind and some are still dependent on having a ministerial guarantee. Um, communities local to me do not like ministerial guarantees at all. They won't touch them with a 25 foot pole. <laughs> So, uh, and, and for the financing, and if people are coming at it from a different angle of financing businesses owned by Indigenous um, peoples or located on reserve, I find the largest challenge they have is getting that BCR because also the bank needs a BCR to be able to step on reserve to do a site assessment or to check, you know, if the thing that financing is still there. Um, and, and you can't go on there without permission, but a lot of times business owners don't want to have that connection with having to get a favor from chief and council to get the BCR issued. They kind of want to still be able, you know, they want to be able to operate independently and, and not have any favors owed to or due from, um, which I think is a valid point. Um, so that's kind of what I see. No, thanks for that. Um, and just uh, maybe a follow-up question. So the uh, so a band council resolution. So when when a, a business or or a business case uh, seeks to get that, uh, is it is it really just a a commitment of su of support and endorsement, or is there is there actually like requ like requirements around it? So if if it's um, if it's an indigenous-owned business that's off community, it's it's. You know the same old same old as, as everyday banking if the indigenous business operates on the community 
then we need a BCR before we can make a term lending, which, or even lines of credit technically too, because we need permission to enter reserve to even view business, to even go and, and, and see if they're operating still. We need permission to set foot. And the other challenge is, is that we can't secure ourselves with collateral like we can off reserve. So what that means is if you um, if you take a loan off reserve, you can you can pledge collateral for it, but then can go repossess if you don't pay. Uh, under the Indian Act, we can't repossess anything on reserve unless the only way that the Indian Act provides that is if it's leased. So what I've been doing to get around all of that is I've been leasing everything. So um, whether it's a refrigerator or a building, I've been calling the building a piece of equipment because it's on a piece of kind of like leased land. So it's a great big giant shed, but it's a great big building. <laughs> so I've been, I've been doing um, leases that basically have a $1 payout at the end so that it's, 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 it's a lease, but it's kind of like a term loan. Um, and so it's, there's, there's kind of different ways around it, but, um, leasing is an option, but a lot of people don't, aren't aware of that either when they go into business. Okay. Oh, thank you, Krista. Um, I, I'm even going to go to another oh, Krista. And the other oh, thing is to add that, um, yeah, sorry for access to financing is the Canadian small business loan guarantee can be used on reserve, which I find often is over looked so that's an option for startups as well uh, as well as own the wake I, I i refer a lot to own the wake actually yeah and uh so brian uh you're on on the call um what are what are your thoughts relating to the financing being identified and um i guess where where, where public uh, public private and maybe all the wake financing coming in uh yeah i suppose nothing so yeah, like uh, in, in following the discussion, I, I would echo a few pieces. Primarily, primarily, what I deal with these days tends to be um, individual entrepreneurs, and so the issue of access to financing, access to capital, barriers to financing, like it's 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 nothing new. Um, it, it's been a challenge. Um, I, I'm, I still consider myself fairly green in the role, but uh, I, I've been doing this for three and a half, four years now, and it's 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 uh, under it's been sort of like an underpinning of the the climate uh, since I started out. So I think what happens sometimes, um, from my perspective, is access to capital for example like some kind of um scenario that i would picture is uh somebody looking at getting into a trade with um zero experience at it but it's like hey i want to start a business i've got a little bit of money um they come to a financer and a financer is going to say okay well um what kind of experience do you have none well in terms of your overall plans at at some day operating a business and it's not going to happen tomorrow um, here's sort of the pieces that I, uh, I see, and I, I would recommend you, you get on a crew, uh, pick up the trade a little bit. Um, and, and it's not even necessarily this, um, maybe they're missing the equity component. Okay. Well, um, bite off a smaller chunk of your overall plan and do it part-time while you build up a little bit of a kitty, build up some equity. Um, we require 10% and, um, so uh, things like that, to me, are part of an overall, um, I don't know, like football field to like accessing capital. Uh, and, and it's kind of a dance as you, as you go towards that, but sometimes access to capital um, seems to be, I applied, I didn't get a yes immediately. And so, it's it's a barrier you know what i mean like uh rather than kind of and, and it's tough because uh, you put so much of yourself into a business i i would see uh, it's something that you're passionate about it's something that you really think you can build an opportunity at and um it's very tough to put yourself into uh something like that and have it be scrutinized 
but um, a lot of what I try to do is take it from the perspective of a lender. So what I want is your business to be as strong as possible because I don't want to uh, I don't want to create a financial burden for you if if the plan is partway conceived or you're, you're not quite thinking through the regulatory environment, if you're going to be selling something that needs some sort of certification, things like that. So it, it, all that to say, um, accessing capital, I, I think you kind of have to take sort of like a 10,000 foot view of it. And, and it sucks to, to feel like you're rejected or whatever, to some extent, because I, I do deal with people who sometimes feel uh, frustrated by um, feedback or decisions that uh, we make. Um, but it, it, on a long enough timeline, I mean, those are the pieces that uh, a strong, viable business uh, typically would have. Or and, and it's all just kind of our perspective as we look at like project to project. So. I don't know if that gives any any sort of. Uh... No, it's that's helpful. I, I think for sure. Uh, and part, so... part of that too, I, I feel like um, something that I've tried to do as I've come into the role is like it's it's not like a no or you know what I mean. Like it's it's taking them through. Okay, when I when I see this part of your finances, like the this business model or this business structure in this industry that you're looking at, like. Cash flow is huge. You you need to kind of make it through these. Uh, this is what the cash flow cycle is typically like in the industry. I, I see that you're not really um, accounting for that. Like, what's is there something I'm not aware of or whatever? And and it's all just uh, this is why I'm asking the questions that I'm asking, um, uh, rather than oh, I'm just trying to give people a hard time. <laughs> I, I I don't want to I don't want to finance their project. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, definitely um, a valid point. If uh, so, I'm what I, you made many valid points. One of them I'm just formalizing here in my notes is uh, is sometimes a no is not a no. It's uh, we need to commit to a plan, and um, and and whether whether or not um, uh, I guess people are motivated motivated to follow through on the plan can be a barrier itself. Um, but yeah, no. potentially, and I, I think part and parcel of kind of getting uh, like as a as a proponent to an opportunity or a, a small business owner, um, part and parcel of kind of knowing the industry and and kind of knowing a little bit of what's uh, achievable year over year, uh, sometimes constrains vision in a good way to to go like okay like a phased approach uh, might fit a project better rather than I'm I'm going to apply for a huge, 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 huge project out the gate and 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 then when when funders try to do their due diligence on that, it becomes uh, more difficult rather than uh, sort of a step-by-step -step phased approach that can kind of see the business grow and and meet its debt obligations over time. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I do want to give the floor to Sherry. Sherry's posted a comment here in the chat. Um, Sherry, uh, over to you. Hi, I'm just, it was just um, some of my own observations in working with communities. Um, and I'm not sure about financing, you know, on and off reserve. There's two categories there because we do provide financing, government financing, and then there's lenders as we've heard from as well as in community there's financing available for folks at different parts of whatever they're going through whether it's education social or uh, moving into business so i think people aren't always aware of what's available to them or understanding and it is scary whether you're indigenous or not to understand how to maneuver through those pieces so to have an ally or someone there, a relationship to help people understand that, to help guide them and to work alongside them, as they talked about earlier about business plans and so forth, is very key, I think, because people become frustrated and give up. When I talk about financing as well as we see in New Brunswick, not only in community members, but folks are struggling. 
So it is difficult to get a loan or to get access to financing because it is not an easy task if you've been bankrupt or if you're struggling with bills and other pieces. So we see more and more of that um, with individuals that are trying to access training or start a business or whatever it might be in life. They can't even get a line of credit. So those are pieces too for help people understand are there other options available or not for them. Um, anyway, I just think that we all can do a better job um, to help these folks understand what's available to them and how they access, as well as what's the consequence if I don't repay or what happens you know, you have to play the devil's advocate a bit too and the risk management to explain things out a bit better. Well, thank you, Sherry. That's great. Um, I do want to, um, uh, I think, I'm just Krista making sure I'm another covering. point. Yeah. yeah, Krista, go ahead. I see you've got a, a nice follow up here. I'm, I'm just typing away madly as, as things come to my mind. So they, I have three kids, so things quickly enter and then evaporate. Um, <laughs> I guess it. it's yeah. mom brain. <laughs> but um, one thing I've been seeing too, both in individuals and communities, is there are some predatory lenders. So when people find it hard to access something, they may find somebody who's willing to do it who may not have their interest at heart their best interest or the community's best interest at heart and um, they they'll be given what they want even if it might not be good for them and then they, by the time they realize that this wasn't such a great thing they might be painted right into the corner and to get out of it it's very possibly expensive or difficult to do um, I've seen it on the community side um, as well as individual the other, uh, and it, the sad part with the community side is somebody else made a point that the decision makers are sometimes not the department heads. So sometimes they'll get painted into a corner and there may be other options that for whatever reason don't make it to the decision makers. Um, but like Sherry's point, I see often on the individual side, the credit scores, the credit report. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, that's just Canadians in general, don't understand how the credit schools are formulated off their credit report and how to manage them. Um, I once kind of put a little tip sheet together for for people when I would have to decline them based on their credit report because there's, there's a couple of few little quick hits people can do that will help um, raise their credit score in about six months. Um, by quite a few points, which might be enough to get them over the line for a lot of different programs. And I think, like Sherry's point on education, the more we could, I mean, it should be high school, I'm thinking, but uh, across the board, uh, just because everybody should have it. But I think lenders play an important role of capacity building. In my view, like here at Roy Royal Bank, anyway, we have a lot of community engagement. I go in and uh, to Medpanagyog and I do workshops on um, financial wealth and acumen to um, uh, students who are starting their first work placement um, in the summer summer work, work positions. Um, so I think if institutions want to kind of play in the economy of having communities as clients and getting the prize of all the economic spinoff that that has and revenue for banks that they should also play a plate that that capacity building for the membership as a whole um, in helping to deliver programming on credit scores and stuff so that that access gets better no those are some great points um, so I got, there's some themes of, of education uh, and, and a number of, uh, so even, even uh, inf, uh, education on credit scores. And uh, so yeah, no, no one gave me a six month course on how to improve my, my credit score. Um, I wish I had that 15 years ago, but that's fine. We'll, we'll learn. Um, the, um, but that's, a, so I, yeah, I, just, I think that makes sense. 
Um, no, great points. Um, well, I think we've got to head back a little early to the session, but we probably have, have time for, for one or two more comments. I do want to give the opportunity to people to make sure they're, uh, they're noted here. So um, Connor's been keeping diligent notes, I'm sure, and we'll try to use as much of this as possible when we're building an action plan and, and reaching out to stakeholders further. Um, so any, uh, any further comments or questions or, 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 or notes of concerns or ideas at this point? Once, once, perfect. So I think, yeah, I think we're right around the 40 minute mark and um, I, I believe we're gonna start the, uh, the larger session uh, sooner than later. So I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Um, we've, like I said, we've been taking diligent notes and try not to lose any of your, your valid comments and uh, look forward to, to following up on this at the next section.